vital lesson in discipleship concerns learning to pray. And that's what we discover in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. We'll read from verse 14 to verse 32 and see how, in response to a simple request, Jesus gives a positive answer. Chapter 9, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is robbed who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, It has often thrown him into water, into fire, to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and dumb spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. They did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Learning to pray. They come down from the mountain where the Lord Jesus has been transfigured back to the disciples. Men have got a problem. And it's a confrontation with Satan. It's interesting that after Jesus' baptism there came God's voice. We read about it in chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. And then, immediately following that, a confrontation with the devil. Jesus goes into the desert and is tempted. Here, after the transfiguration and God's voice again from the cloud, there's another satanic confrontation. God had said, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It seems that Satan hates Jesus to be called God's son. And note the situation here. Here's a father with his son. The boy's deaf and dumb, with epileptic symptoms, but in fact possessed by an evil spirit. And the disciples can't bring release. Jesus says, you needed to pray. 
And so we get a lesson about prayer. First of all, we discover that real prayer is related to faith. I must believe that God exists in order to pray meaningfully. That's the very first step. And prayer is a step of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 we read, Without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In other words, that he responds. He answers those who earnestly seek him. So I must believe that God hears and answers prayer. No good really going to God without that. So where did the disciples fail? Was it that they believed that they could deal with this particular evil spirit in their own strength and power? After all, they had cast out demons. Jesus had told them to. You'll recall that in chapter 6, verse 7, that was his command. And in verse 13, that was their experience. Had they forgotten Christ's authority and relied on their own? They got so used to doing the job. That's possible. And certainly, self-reliance in Christ's service is fatal. There's a lesson I have to learn here, and it's just this, that self-confidence must never replace God-confidence. And Jesus certainly underlined their need for faith, this God-confidence. Do you remember how in Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now, the boy's father needed to learn this lesson. And he was learning it. He makes a, a request of Jesus. In other words, he prays. You find it in the last part of verse 22. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. That was his first prayer. There's no evidence actually of faith. So Jesus prompts him in verse 23, taking up the Father's word, if you can. If you can, says Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. He's prompting. And the Father responds. Verse 24 reads, Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And so he discovers that though his faith may well be weak, it's there. And Jesus answers that prayer. And so I learn another lesson. It's just this, that faith as small as a mustard seed can remove tremendous obstacles. In Luke chapter 17, we read in verses 5 and 6, that the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith. They wanted big faith. And Jesus' response seems to have been this. It's not the size of faith that matters. Just faith like a grain of mustard seed. But it's who you put your faith in that's important. And so, real faith has to be placed in the, the person who can answer prayer. But the second concept is just this, that real prayer looks for the right results. And here it was for the deliverance of the little boy and the defeat of the devil. And it was answered as desired. Here you have it in verses 25 and and 26, Jesus rebuked the spirit, you deaf and dumb spirit, he says, I command you to come out of him, never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. And he was released. It doesn't always work that way. 
Sometimes we pray and we seem to have faith, trust the Lord to answer the prayer. And yet, the prayer isn't answered in the way we expect. Or doesn't seem to be answered at all. There may be a variety of reasons. Sometimes we, we pray, but with the wrong motives. James, in chapter 4, verse 3, highlights that when he writes, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In other words, you ask with selfish motives. And God doesn't answer. Or sometimes we have a, an unforgiving attitude which blocks prayer. In this Gospel, chapter 11, verse 25, we read, When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sin. And James seems to underline it in, in a positive way when he says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So an unforgiving attitude can block sin, but a righteous character, an upright person, has access to God. But there's yet another reason why sometimes prayer isn't answered. We ask, but it isn't God's will. Again, James, or rather John, highlights this particular fact in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. We read there, This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we know that God does hear, if it's according to his will. But the request may be wrong. The time may be wrong. Or God has a better way. A whole range of possibilities exist. And even in this connection, Jesus put himself under the same restriction. You read about it in, in Mark 14, where the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prays, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. The cross was a, a formidable a formidable feature that Jesus had to approach. And he asked that perhaps it might be removed, but not what he wanted, what God wanted. It's not always easy to accept or understand this kind of situation. It wasn't easy for us in Pakistan, when after 14 years God sent a young man of 24 to help us in youth work from Scotland. And six months later, I buried him. He died of encephalitis. We don't understand always what God's doing. Why he is answering prayer in one situation, not in another. Not always easy to accept or understand, but God does know best. And he doesn't make mistakes. Now, the right result in Mark chapter 9 was a boy well and strong. And Jesus answered that prayer in the way that the Father desired too. But we learn a final concept about prayer, finally from Jesus himself. And that is that real prayer isn't just asking for specific things, it's a way of life. That was Jesus' practice. You find twice in this Gospel, first in chapter 1, where it's recorded, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. It seems to have been quite a habit with the Lord Jesus. You read about it again in chapter 6, verse 46. After leaving them, he went into the hills to pray. And if Jesus needed to pray regularly, it sets a pattern for you and me. It's not always easy. There in the garden of Gethsemane, we read in chapter 14, verse 38, that the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And they fell into the trap of going asleep. And many of us can 
identify with that, who've tried having quiet times early in the morning or late at night to find ourselves going to sleep while we're talking with God. Not always easy, but it's a habit to cultivate. In Ephesians 6 verse 18, Paul writes, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. On all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And he said a very brief word of guidance to the Thessalonian Christians when in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 he wrote pray continually it didn't mean shutting oneself away in a room and spending all day and night in prayer but it did mean that as they went around they should share things with God seek his guidance talk with him about the things that affected them during their day real prayer is a way of life and so these three concepts surface in scripture that real prayer is first of all related to faith trusting that God can and will answer and real prayer also looks for the right results not necessarily the ones that we first of all think are desirable and that prayer too is a way of living that we can walk and talk to the Lord Jesus day by day let's talk to him now our loving Lord Jesus Christ we come to you as those who have still a tremendous amount to learn about prayer we are your disciples and we do want to learn we pray that you will teach us day by day how to trust you more how to recognize those things that you really want us to ask for and to commit to you and help us as a matter of living, to live in your presence and to talk to you often. We thank you that we can come to you in this way and do so in your holy name. Amen.